Good evening. I'm Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, joined by my absolute favorite co-host, Yocheved Goldberg, and we are here to take you behind the bima. Yocheved, welcome back. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back. So happy that you're here. I want to acknowledge our sponsor, Daily Aliyah, a collection of practical divrei Torah on every Aliyah of every Parsha, an amazing, amazing project. Seven divrei Torah, each Parsha, a lesson for every day of the week. You can get it at your local bookstore. You can order it online. All the proceeds are going to daily giving, which is incredible. So mitzvah, goreris, mitzvah, one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. It's a lot of gratitude to daily aliyah. Check it out. Get a hold of it. It will enhance. It will enrich your life. So Rebetzin, Yocheved, I read a story recently. Husband and wife were at the airport. And this, of course, has nothing to do with us. Just an interesting story to bring up where the wife said, I'm going to get a coffee. And he said, you'll never be back in time. And she said, I need my coffee. And he said, you'll never be back in time. And she said, I have to go get a coffee. And he said, if you're not back, I'm going. And the Starbucks was in another terminal or another area that she took a big risk because she assumed she could go and come back. And she couldn't imagine that she wouldn't make it back in time. And the husband, Taka, got on the plane. She wasn't back, took off and left his wife behind. That was the story. That was the article. Any thoughts? Any 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 lessons? Yeah, well, there's more backgrounds to that story that she had done that before and made them miss a flight. And so it wasn't like this was the first time. And he kind of said, like, I can't keep doing this and missing flights. So this time he put his foot down and got on a plane. I, 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 I agree. I mean, I think I agree with him. I know you think that I'm going to take the white side because you don't have to be the first person at the airport. And I'm not always so early and on time. But in this case, when, you know, she had to go to a Starbucks in a different terminal, that's a little bit, that's a little bit, extreme. a little bit excessive, but and some so might say boarding, you know, not, not smart. some might say through thickness, through thin, through this, through that. If she misses the flight, you miss the flight. Maybe you'll never talk to her again. You'll be furious. You'll be angry. You'll be frustrated. But you know, what kind of husband gets on a plane without his wife yeah, or, yeah. or was he justified? You know, are there times that it's okay to you take that risk. You're taking that risk. I'm not late or missing. I don't know where they were going, a vacation, a wedding, a business trip. I don't know. So, you know, are you all in it together, even when one is bringing the other one down because they're not as punctual? <laughs> or are you entitled when the other party is not as punctual to say they can suffer the consequence? I'm not going to. I don't think you should ever be teaching your spouse a lesson. So that part of it, I'm not so into. But I think that they need to figure out how to work on this together and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, I can't answer if he did the right thing or not, because I understand his frustration. I also don't think it's so nice to do, go off without your wife. And I can't imagine how she felt being left behind. But again, the article has a lot more background information. That wasn't the first time. And she has this pattern right. and, and, yeah. and so. All right. Which is a total for us, hypothetical. I mean, it was just a total. I've never made you late. To never. Just totally academic conversation based on an interesting article that we saw. We had a great week at Boca Raton Synagogue. We're really proud, really excited. Amazing things that went on. Slichos Night, our amazing Neshe, had an event. Tell us about it. It was so beautiful and so inspiring. We, um, In previous years, we always have a women's event during the month of Elul or during the Arsai's May Tshuva to prepare women to be able to enter this yant of season and be spiritually prepared and be inspired. And we've always brought in, like, I actually taught it a few times and we brought in guest speakers through the years and we'd always make it like it was always a very nice crowd and people walked away very inspired. But last year we came up with the idea of having women from our community speak because so many, so many of us have our own journeys, our own stories. And it's a beautiful idea to share it amongst ourselves that we could be inspired by the people around us. And those people live here. So now we could know them better and access them and learn from their wisdom and from their life experience. So last year we had three women from our community who spoke. It was a, it was a huge crowd and people walked away really, really inspired. They loved it. And we said, we're going to do the same model again this year. This time we had four speakers and each of the speaker had a different story. One of them was a, a Balas Chuba in her adult years and what it was like to change her whole family's trajectory and that there was someone else who had fertility challenges and a baby that was born with uh, with some health issues. We had someone else who lost her son to a, to a disease and another one who lost her husband. And um, each of them just spoke so powerfully and with so much poise and strength and amuna and their stories were, I mean, people, there was not a dry eye and it was just, it was extremely moving. Um, we actually showed just to break it up a little, we showed a video in the middle. It's one, it's a very moving song. It's a, a newish song that was in uh, memory of a Zachary Wallerstein about a butterfly 
learning to fly, find its wings. Even when you feel lost, you could still, and I love that song. So I thought that would be a nice kind of intermission. We had food, we had people schmoozing. Amazing. There were hundreds of women. Great. Yeah. On a hundreds great of campus. women. The social hall was packed. Yeah. And the feedback that we've gotten has been phenomenal. And we're not sharing that to flex, although we're always happy to, but we're sharing that because it's a great idea for other communities. Yeah. There are people among us. We don't always have to run to spend a lot of money and bring in outside speakers. There are extraordinary, extraordinary people who seem ordinary, but have extraordinary life stories. Um, some happy and, and others sad, but there are lessons to learn from them. And, and it's, we've sort of tapped into this and last year, this year, and, and already can't wait for next year. And I'm, I'm not speaking for myself. It's in the Shea program for women. But I just the feedback we got was really fantastic. So yeah, it's also like it's also an important way to start the year that you're now part of a community. You know, there were new members who were in that room and they now see like, you know, I'm living among people who are sharing, who are, you know, there's so much to learn from each other. And I think that was also the goal of the night. Like, you know, get to know your neighbors, get to know the members of the community. We have really, really special people here all have a story and all have so much to share and so much to learn from and be inspired from and you know, so much to respect and admire. Community of learners. Yeah. It's really great. Really the goal. You know, you're now part, you were part of a community and we all feel this connection to each other. And it's, it's great. It's and then we had a great Slichos night. Sunday morning, we had a great new member event. But I want to highlight again, Sunday, Monday, we did, now we've done it several times, a pre-Rosh Hashanah, pay what you want, pay what you can market. Um, we were supposed to go from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. On Sunday, food was gone by 4 p.m which is a reflection not that we underordered, but just how big the need is. And we're so honored and grateful to the amazing, generous sponsors from Boca Raton, but from well outside of Boca Raton as well, who enabled this because people drove from all over South Florida. I know it went to a lot of chats, a lot of lists. People came from all over. I, I tried to volunteer a little. I didn't linger too long. But while I was there, just what people said in gratitude and appreciation and finding relief and being able to make Yantif, uh, we did it both Sunday and Monday, truckloads and truckloads of food what was put out shlomi lagasi our hero we love shlomi almost single-handedly but he didn't he had a whole a team an army of volunteers who helped stock the shelves build the shelves replenish the shelves help people carry things to their cars it was it was amazing and it 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 reveals and reflects what is a real need which is sad but when people in a community can step up and care and compensate and provide that relief it's really meaningful and then last night we had this program that we were honored to host for the OU with the OU, which was a panel on Shiduchim, not on Shiduchim, singles. panel on singles, but the opposite. Not the focus on Shiduchim, but the focus on the singles experience, not the singles process about how to get married, but their experience, what it's like to be single and to be what the world might call an older single in an Orthodox community that is so family centric. And it brought a lot of uh, attention, a lot of interesting, thought provoking conversation and ideas. And uh, hopefully it was a, was a great night and a great conversation. Rebetzin, Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Talk to us about what goes through your mind. How do you, as a Jewish mother, as a Jewish wife, as a Jewish woman, as an Eved Hashem, just a human being, what goes into your round chalos, to your recipes, to your opening the machzor, to thinking about shul? How, what's it like being a Rebetzin on Rosh Hashanah? People watching the way you daven. Can you just daven and lose yourself in your davening? Well, I, before we even get to what I do, I think that what we just spoke about all of those three programs, events that the shul hosted, I think are all different things that we could tap into this end of season. You know, whether that's the inspiration, the spiritual and uh, camaraderie and all of that that happened at the Neshe event, the practicalities of supplying your food and preparing and making sure that you're feeding your family and, and your inviting. guests. Right? And then the third thing with, this, with the panel on singles is to make sure that you're involving the community members who may not have a place to go or... No one should ever be alone on a Shabbos or Yantif ever. And it's upon us, our, the community members, to keep those people in mind. You know, people who would really want to feel like they're part of your Yantif and, and that you could be mindful of them. And I think all of that is the chesed and the spiritual preparation and the physical preparation. So there's definitely a lot that goes into this Yantif season. And, uh, you know, we all do our best. I just was meeting with somebody yesterday, a young woman in the community, and she was kind of asking, like, I just need a little bit of, like, some tips, some advice how do you do, how do we do this? Like it's, you know, two days down to four meals, you know, all the simanim and all of the different, you know, the round chalas and special preparations. How, how can we do it all? And, you know, I think that we need to be organized. That's first of all, I'm a big fan of lists and making sure that I have my shopping list going and I have my menu going and I know when I'm making what and make sure I have all the ingredients. And so all of that goes into it. But I also think about 
the um, two weeks ago behind the bima when uh, Slavi Young Rice Wolf so beautifully said that even though some of us might not be making it to shul or might not be able to go to or go in the slichos or tap into the spiritual parts of preparing for this yantif or being part of this yantif, there's so much that we could do to just infuse our routine everyday preparations for yantif or on yantif itself with spirituality and with meaning. And if every food we make, we're thinking about this should keep our family healthy. This should be, you know, a, a, a semen tov for our, you know, our, our, our family, our community, our all Klal Yisrael. Like there's so many kavanas and so many different things we could do to infuse our food, our prep, our everything that we're doing with, with a lot of spirituality and a connection to Hashem always. So that's, I feel, something that we could all do, you know, no matter where we are and, and what we're up to. And, uh, and that's how we prepare. Tell, tell everyone, what's, what's your signature dish? When you think Rosh Hashanah and you think a recipe, what comes to mind? What's your signature dish? It all comes back to food. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I happen to enjoy cooking. And, uh, you know, when I'm like in my cooking clothing, my kids know, you know how to find me in the kitchen. When it's Arab, Shabbos or Yantif, I have like a few hours. I just bang out a lot of different dishes. I love to cook and I love preparing food. Um, I, I make something that I that I like. That's called the uh, it's called green currant soup. It's a it's a German chalent. I'm sure some of you watchers and listeners have maybe heard of it or have family members who've who've made it. It's it's from Germany. The wheat kernel that's used for the green currant soup is actually comes from Germany. You can only buy it in like specialty stores. Some of the kosher stores have it. We don't have it here. I bring it from a kosher supermarket up north. Um, but it's a special soup that uh, it's always a crowd pleaser and it's easy to make and vegetables and meat and bones and that special green curd and, and delicious and whatever. So that's probably, I guess but, that's but if, it was my own. If you, make, if you make green curd soup and your yekka, you can't be late to the flight. You can't go get the coffee. Bring it back full circle. Here you we go. Be on time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What else? I'm sorry yes. I interrupted you. No, no, no. That's, that's this. I mean, I, there are a lot of things I enjoy making. And I, what I try to do also, and this is some advice that I gave that woman yesterday is don't use Yuntif as like a time to start like making these new, you know, crazy convoluted dishes that like looked amazing in the magazine. And you want to try to like, you know, make these like crazy shape challahs and, you know, use apples 10 different ways. And, you know, I, I understand, and I think we all have that desire to make Yanta very special and unique and make your shop, you know, Yanta table so beautiful. But if that's going to really be stress you out and, and take you away from what you really could be focused on and just good food, enough food, and preparing yourself spiritually, then maybe save the creativity for a regular stam, quiet Chavez, and not try to throw it all into this yant of season. Because you know, like, like we say about Pesach prep, don't do a spring cleaning, because that's not what Pesach prep is about. Save spring right. cleaning for the summer, you know, and just focus on Pesach. I think this time of year too. Save all of that entertaining. And, and it's hard because you see it all around you, all the websites and all the apps and all the, you know, the magazines and everyone's showing these fancy place cards and, and food items. And you want to kind of like be part of that and this massive entertainer and you do such a beautiful job in your house and your table. And But if that's going to really end up stressing you out and that you can't be fully on for your yantif and be able to enjoy it and, and be well rested and all that, don't, don't yeah. do that for Yantiv. Keep That keep is great simple. advice. Keep that is simple. great advice. And Yechavet, I want to tell you, I would never, ever leave you behind at the airport unless you were going to make me miss my flight. Then you would be on your own. Very I excited like to be able to bring you. trying to send me these messages. This whole no, no, time. no. It's not that, it was just, <laughs> it's nothing to do with us. Don't worry. <laughs> it has nothing to do with us. Um, thank you again to Daily Aliyah, an amazing, amazing project. Check it out and enhance your understanding of the Parsha each and every week. We're so honored and excited to bring on our special guest this evening, Rivka Ravitz. I don't know where to go. I could read her resume. It would take the entire rest of the show, so I, I won't tell it all, but she's an administrator, advisor. She's guided and managed government officials and ministries for over 20 years. She was the chief of staff to the president, the 10th president of Israel, President Rivlin. She was the bureau manager for the speaker of the Knesset, minister of communication. She was a, an economic advisor to the Knesset finance committee. She describes herself as a Haredi woman. She has 12 children. She has a BA, two MAs, and is finishing her PhD from the University of Haifa. We'll get into all of this in speaking to her, but it's really an extraordinary woman doing extraordinary things. And we're so excited that she's agreed to go behind the bima with us. Without any further ado, Rivka Rabbits. Such a pleasure to welcome Rivka Rabbits behind the bima. Thank you so much. On a busy week, everyone preparing for Rosh Hashanah. 
and a busy household. Baruch Hashem, we know what a large family that you have. Kenai Nahara and busy responsibilities, helping uh, so many. And so we're so grateful you gave us some time and you agreed to join us behind the bima. So, so Rivka, let's let's get started with this. There's so much to talk about your life, your background, and and we've all read and, and watched and heard the story with the Pope and with President Biden bowing down to you. And we'll, we'll get to all of that. But I want to start with this, from from this perspective, from America, but even from within Israel itself, it feels there's so so much division. It's so divided. There's so much machlokas, judicial reform, Haredi chiloni, religious, non-religious, army service, no army service. It seems like some of those divisions are bigger and stronger than ever. And we're going into Rosh Hashanah, a time the Jewish people need to be united and strong. Are you hopeful? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? What do you think is the way forward in trying to heal some of these wounds politically and religiously and socially? Is it true that it's worse than ever? Does it just feel that way? What's your take on, on where we are? So the matzah in Israel is not so good. It's really pretty worse. I think the 25 years I was working for the Knesset and for the government and always uh, working with uh, secular uh, people, I never felt bad as uh, at the last uh, few months, uh, really uh, attacking the Haredi community in Israel, feeling like it's, it's, it's something else than what I was used to. Even though I, I, I went through not easy um, times in Israel. Uh, there's a real machlokas now, uh, also about the ju- uh, judicial uh, reform, also about uh, serving in the army, not serving in all those issues. I think I don't think it's it's the it, it's the details. It's that it, that's the issue. I think something bigger is happening. I think that uh, the Haredi community getting bigger. Uh, is threatening someone. Someone is is really afraid, and uh, they give it names. They call it the judicial uh, reform. They call it the going to the army, uh, conversion. You could give it an, a lot of names, but I think that the Haredi community uh, is threatening uh, by getting uh, large, larger, very far, fast in Israel, and I think that's the issue. And each one gives it a different name, but that's that's the issue. And and I really feel uh, as I never felt uh, being attacked sometimes, uh, feeling that something bad is happening. But still, I think I'm still optimistic. What, and what's the reason for the optimism? Do you see are there examples of healing of the wounds? Do you see the communities talking to each other? When you ha- as you've been serving the Knesset and chief of staff to the president of Israel as a Haredi woman. Were there non-religious who admired that or gave positive feedback? What, what's the source of the optimism? Give us some hope as we're going into the new year. So I think that my, my optimism is, is going through that um, point that we still are people to people. When I talk privately with people, with no politicians around us, with no uh, judges around us, there's still that uh, plain uh, Ahavas Israel that I, I, I always saw. Really, I, I went uh, around the world. I was vid- visiting places like Morocco, like uh, Singapore, like um, places that w- there were almost no um, Jewish communities. And still, I always found a shul, usually a Chabad shul, uh, a place to eat if it was Shabbat. And what I saw then all around the world, I still uh, see uh, around me, and that keeps me optimistic because when it comes to be people to people talking, even if it's the most leftist uh, person in, in uh, like I have some very, really people, colleagues that work with me today that they go to those protests every week and they really are afraid uh, that Israel won't uh, stay a democratic state and th- a state and things like that. Um, still, when we talk, when we sit down and talk, I still see that uh, playing Ahavat Israel um, raising uh, between us and uh, give it, uh, that what gi- what's uh, giving me some uh, optimism, I think. We'll grab onto that. Tell us, tell us how you got started in this career path. How how this your whole story began in Israeli politics in the Knesset. What was what was the impetus? How did it begin? We'd love to hear the background of all of it. 
So um, I was not uh, born to be a politician and it was never my dream when I was young. I had two dreams, to be a mother of a big family and to be a teacher. And I, I learned to be a teacher. I was learning in a, in a teacher's seminary in Geula and Melchai Israel, if you know, in Jerusalem. And I wanted to be an English teacher. And uh, my dream even uh, came true because uh, the school where I learned um, appointed me to be an, an English teacher. And I, I was really very happy with that. Uh, but that uh, very summer, my father-in-law, uh, Rabbi Abraham Ravitz, he was the head of Degel Torah the most uh, Haredi uh, party in the Knesset. And he helped Netanyahu to become uh, prime minister for the first time. That was 96 and 97. And um, as appreciation to him helping uh, Netanyahu to become a pre uh, prime minister, uh, so Netanyahu gave him a very good uh, job in the Knesset. He appointed him to be the head of the finance committee. That's a very important uh, committee in the Knesset. Uh, where we build uh, the budget of the state and everything. And he uh, invited me to come and work with him. So uh, to begin with, I told him, no, I'm busy. I'm going to be a teacher. But then um, I came to work with him. And that's how I started my way in the Knesset. And from there, you just uh, kept going up and up and up. And how, how did you balance that at the same time with your other dream, you said, was to have a large family? And Kanai Nahara, 12 children, correct? And it's a very large family. And it's, how do you balance it all? The education that you have, which we'll get into, the career in which you've made a name. And uh, clearly you were a critical part of, of so many people, including uh, to be appointed chief of staff for the president of Israel with all the children at home and a growing family. How does one multitask? How does one find balance in the outside life and the inside life? So today when I'm a bit older and the children are uh, not so young anymore, so when I, I'm, I'm not sure how I, <laughs> how I did it. It was not easy when they were like uh, three years old and two and one and having another baby and working so hard. Um, my husband helped me a lot. Um, he was really supportive and helping and staying with the children sometimes, even though he is a politician himself, he is a mayor and he's working uh, also very hard. My family helped, my mother, and I had a lot of uh, help uh, around me. But I'm not sure if I had to go through that again. I I'm not sure <laughs> I would do it again. Are there Must any tips you have for multitasking? Any tips for how to get a lot done in a day? Time management, multitasking to people who have big dreams and want to get a lot done without having to give up on any of them, other than just pushing hard and having help around you. So people think I don't get uh, sleep, and that's not true. I think a, a very important uh, hint is to sleep well. So I try to sleep at least six hours a night, and then I wake up between uh, four and five o'clock in the morning, and and then I take some time for myself. Um, I, I go to run, and I dive in, and I start my day about six or six thirty, and I try re really not <laughs> not to waste too much time. So I I really try to to use the the first hours of the day when I'm still um, uh, my mind is still uh, working well. So I use those hours for writing and doing things that I uh, need um, more uh, to think. And then I take the other hours and do the easier things. So I have like a few lists. I have a list of the things that I need to write down and I need I the time of the, of the morning. And then I have a list of, of if um, I need a break and I want, just want to finish some things to do, but not things that I uh, need my mind too much. So I, I try to, to use the time each time suits something else so not to you know not to take something that's too hard for me if it's already two o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock and i'm already after seven hours of writing something so i, I won't to won't succeed right how do you prepare I, I just met with a young woman in the community was asking you know it's so hard the yom tovim and how much there is to do and prepare and you know emotionally and, and physically food and you know just getting in the right mindset I, I can't even imagine you being asked that question with everything on your plate. How, how do you prepare for the Yom Tov and the ones coming up for Pesach for all throughout the year? You know, whether it's making your beautiful Shabbos Yontif table and 
being able to, you know, get all your children ready and prepared and yourself ready spiritually? How do you, how do you do it all? So now this Yantef coming up, we will uh, feel what you feel usually having two days, you know? So we, it does, it really happens here maybe once, uh, maybe two times a year. So now we, were, we are having two days of Yantef together and that's not easy for us Israelis. Um, so again, I have lists. Uh, first of all is the list of what I have to buy. And then usually I try to cook uh, very close to Shabbos, not using uh, the fridge, not using the uh, my, my freezer, like just cooking it, putting it uh, straight to the hot pot. So it, it, it does. I, I don't waste time on, on packing and opening and putting in and, put, and taking out and things like that. Um, but but this Shabbos and Yantef together, I'll, I'll have to waste time on uh, thinking what should uh, go to the second day and packing and and uh, using my fridge and freeze, freezer and things like that. Uh, so yes, I use a lot of lists. I use my um, calendar writing down like using hours like like we used to work in the in, in the president house when we had a big event. So you, you take the hour of the of the event starting and then you go backwards. Uh, what has to happen an hour before what happened what has to happen two hours before uh, so I use those uh, lists. Do you think your your role, you know, recently interviewed the chief rabbi of uh, the United Commonwealth of England uh, after he had attended the inauguration of the new king? And I asked him, you're living or you're meeting a king in a palace today. Do you think you have a different perspective on what it means to have a relationship with the Melech Machayam Lachem, the king of kings? So I'd ask you a similar question. You've traveled the world. You've been in palaces. You've met with royalty and heads of state and presidents and prime ministers uh, the famous story of, of of not shaking the hand of the Pope or President Biden being so impressed with being a mother of 12 and being a chief of staff that he got on the floor literally and bowed to you. Being in the Oval Office, being in palaces, being exposed to royalty and, and leadership and power, does that influence your religious life at all? Coming into Rosh Hashanah, being Mam Lech Hashem, coronating God as the King of Kings, do you think that your professional experience, your career, your travels have positioned you to understand that or bring a different religious mindset or consciousness that that other people don't have yeah i think uh, the answer is yes uh, usually when we go to meet a king or a queen or even the pope so we like guess get a small list and they first of all we get money to buy a new dress each one of the staff gets two thousand shekels or dollars it doesn't matter uh, to buy new clothing because we are going to meet a queen or a king and then we get a list, a small paper, and they write down how we have to uh, call the king. If it's a king, it's his ma- uh, his majesty. If it's the pope, it's his holiness. If it's just a president, it's his, uh, like you have a whole uh, highness, his, his, uh, you have all the uh, names you have to call them. And if you don't use the right name, you are in a big trouble. And so going to meet a king and uh, having to buy uh, have buy a new dress and have to call him in the uh, appropriate uh, name, um, I always think about Avinu Malkeinu. Um, that's our father that loves us as children and wants to give us everything. And he's also Malkeinu. He's also our king. Uh, so he's the only one that... He's also our father and wants to give us everything like like his children, but he's also our king and he has the ability uh, and he has influence in our lives. He could give us everything because it, usually every father wants to give his children everything. He will bring down the moon for them, right? But they can't. He's just a father. But if he is our also our king and he has the ability and the influence in our lives to give us everything. So when I see a uh, Melech Basar Vadam, a king or a pope, and I and I and we get so excited, and everyone like is shaking and thinking, what should I say? What should I wear? What should I uh, put? A, which shoes should I put on? And we are going to re- to, to meet the the real uh, Avinu Malkeinu, the king that has influence and could influence and wants to influence our lives. Uh, we have to be really uh, uh, much more excited than meeting a king and 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 the. Exciting thing is that he lets us to call him Avinu. He lets us to to talk with him, know his holiness, know his highness, know his 
just we could just open our mouths and talk with him like he's our uh, uh, father. So that's really very exciting. Was there one particular moment in, in your career, somebody that you met that was the most memorable? Obviously, we referenced the, the meeting with the Pope and, and the president. Are there other leaders in the world or other moments that, that you really uh, look at and that stand out for you? A few times in, in my career. I remember it's very uh, clear from the meeting with the Pope, but it happened to me a few times. Before having a demanding minute, like standing then before the door of the Pope, knowing that I can't shake hands with him, but I also can't bow. Usually when I can't shake hands, so I know I'm going to give a small bow and 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 give an explanation and, and apologize. But here I can't do it. And I was really so scared and my stomach was like shaking. And, and, and I remember thinking to myself, there's a, a school, you know, we are Litvaks, so we don't really use schools, but, but this is a school of um, a remedy from Reb Chaim um, So it's a school of Litvaks. And he says that if you are having tra- trouble with the government or something like that, a uh, judge or something, you could say, Einod Nuvado. And why uh, saying Einod Nuvado helps you when having trouble with um the government or a king or a minister or a prime minister, because you you stand uh, before them and you think, oh, I'm so scared. They could influence me. They could, I could have got a punishment or something, but it's not true. Not, none of them could influence our lives. Enod Mavado, there's only one uh, uh, king in the world that really uh, could change um, something in my in, in, in my life. Uh, so I remember saying to myself, Enod Mavado, Enod Mavado, Enod, Enod Mavado, it helped. The school, the remedy worked. And since then, I used it a few times again and again. And it, it's a good school. Wow. Did you did you let the people around you know? Did the president know that you wouldn't be bowing or shaking hands? Or did you just decide, this is what I have to do, I'll do it, and I'll figure it out afterward? No, I, I told them before. They, first of all, they know. The people that work with me, they know. But I also uh, always let know, to know that to the other side. So I asked them, especially at this case, because they knew I can't give a bow. So I asked our ambassador, the Israeli ambassador, to tell um, his staff, the Pope's staff, but he forgot. I really, it was important to me, especially at this meeting, because I knew that um, I, I can't give him a bow and I can't apologize that way that I'm used to, uh, to apologize. But he forgot. And he just told me that at the last minute. So I, I really didn't have anything to do with it. Just saying, I know. Wow. Oh my goodness. You're, you're clearly well positioned for this role and you're doing it so beautifully and so modestly. And, you know, we're all in awe of you. Um, how would you, would you recommend to other women to try to pursue this? I don't know if it's we call it high profile or this demanding job, this, you know, this job that you, um, you know, have fallen into and, and do it so beautifully. Would you, rec- if your daughter wanted to follow in your footsteps or if you know, other, a neighbor or a friend, you know, some other women who, you know, have these dreams or have this potential, would you recommend them following in this? Or you feel like, you know, I, I, I do it, but, you know, other jobs, other positions are better. What do you say? <laughs> Good question. So it's easier for me to recommend to a neighbor or a different uh, woman. First of all, I think I, I would I will recommend each one to fulfill her dreams. Yes, um, I will tell her it was not easy. If it was my daughter, so <laughs> I would love her not to want to to work so much. And and really, my daughters didn't want to work so much. I think they had like some anti to what I did. Uh, so they are. Uh, more staying home with their children, uh, with their young uh, babies. Um, but if if one of my daughters would want, I really will recommend her to fulfill her dreams. I think that's the best thing for everyone in the world, women and men. That doesn't matter. Uh, but I will I will give her some explanations about um, working with politicians, running campaigns. Uh, working uh, seven days a week and th- things like that. 
you have a good list going of good tips and advice <laughs> <laughs> that I have here. I don't need a list for that. It's a book. It's a book. One day, we'll we'll look forward to that book because it is yeah. a balance. Obviously, as a, as a Haredi woman who proudly identifies as Haredi, and is is striking that balance of of living modestly and and with sneers and not breaching boundaries, but at the same time unapologetically fulfilling a role and and fulfilling a mission and making a difference. It's a very narrow balance, and a lot of people fall off in one direction or the other. Uh, maybe don't fulfill a dream and. And, and use modesty maybe excessively too much or, or pursue a dream in a way that they breach the boundaries of modesty. So, not, you know, walking that, that very fine line, do you have any advice for the people, like Yechevet said, who are fulfilling their dreams and they're trying to walk, they don't want to give up. They, they also consider themselves, whether it's Haredi or whatever particular Hashkafa, but they have Yerushalayim, they, fear, they have fear of Hashem and, and they want to stay true to their values, but also stay true to who they could be. What, what are some advice about how to how to make sure that you're not falling off in either direction? So first of all, I, I really owe uh, the thanks to my father and to my husband. My father gave us a really a very um, strict chinuch of uh, of what's important and what's uh, not important in life. And my husband also he's he's even though he is a politician himself, and his father was a politician, one of the first Haredi politicians in Knesset. It was not easy those days. I'm going 40, uh, 40 years ago, there was almost no Haredi in the Knesset. And he, he, he really, he, stucks, he sticks to his emet, his emes, uh, even though if it's sometimes not so comfortable. And, and I really, I think I took that, that from them. It's not, it's not um, something that I feel um, I could do by myself. Uh, and what helped me sometimes is also davening, really. It, it sounds like, but yeah, it helped me uh, waking up a bit earlier and, and, and saying something um, uh, to Hashem, asking Him to help me. Sometimes I knew that it, it's a demanding day and, and um, a lot of uh, things on my, on my schedule. Um, and I also really always tried Sometimes I had just time at Shabbos, but I really tried to learn something every day, even if it was like five minutes of learning something small, reading Parsha uh, Shavua or Chavat Levavot or something, Mesilat uh, Yisharim, something really small, just to remember um, what's important in Jewish life and what are the like just noises around us. You know that we have so much noises when you go out to the to, to politics, you, you, you hear so much junk. So sometimes I needed that um, that to hold me. I'm, I'm curious what you do to to shut out, you know, you talk about the noise and there is so much noise and, and obviously a much smaller scale as a rabbi and a rebbitzin of a, of a fairly large community. Anytime you take a public role, even are having this and trying to bring these conversations to a wide audience and, and to offer inspiration, a lot of people share their very unsolicited feedback. A lot of people send emails and phone calls and social media and online, and there's a wonderful feedback you get, and it's unbelievably enriching. Every email, every text, every time somebody says something positive, it, it just pushes you and drives you to go forward, not about you, but about serving Hashem and the mission, and it's wonderful, and we're so grateful, and we welcome it. And there's constructive criticism. Sometimes people respectfully will offer an opinion and give you a different perspective, and it's really valuable. It helps you stay in check. But then there's just the haters, then there's just noise and critics and haters and people threatened. And I can only imagine for you sort of breaking through some ceilings, all without compromising, obviously, who you are and where you're from. But I imagine on all sides, there are people who don't like that you're a Haredi. There may be a Haredi who don't like as a Haredi woman that you're playing this role. There are politicians who are on the other side of the, the people that you were working with and for. And I'm sure you've got a lot of heat, a lot of, a lot of pressure. How do you deal with that? How do you let that bounce off of you? How do you not take that to heart? How do you, do, do you ever get down? Do you have a bad day? Do you get sad? Do you get depressed? How do you cope, how do you cope and oh, navigate all the people's opinions? Of course, I have bad days, of course. First of all, I'll tell you, I write I write a lot, and I don't know if you know that paper called Haaretz. Sure. It's most of the leftist papers in Israel. So I write um, um, like opinions there. And they also have a site. And then on the site, people call me and say, oh, did you see what people are writing about you? Like yeah, 200, um, like, like you said, haters. And 
So no, I don't read those. I just write and I go on. I don't read uh, the haters, but of course it gets to your hair, to your to your ears, and to your phone, and you hear it. And my husband is also a politician, and my husband is a mayor. And as a mayor, I'm sure you know that you just go out to shul and you you meet every everything you can. You go just to buy milk and and you meet people. So so I just I just tell him a lot. You know it. Why would Hashem pay their salary? Because no one else will say a good word and no one else will say thank you. Uh, you have to do the right thing. And then Hashem will pay our uh, our, our salary, right? So I'm sure that uh, as a rabbi, uh, you know what we as a mayor and a politician, we go through. And so, of course, I have some hard days. Uh, and me and my husband, we try to take a break once a week. Uh, we do that on Fridays and when the children are in schools and we have a half a day off, a half day off. So we go out, we go to drink something, a coffee or to the, to the beach or something like that. But we really try to take a few hours a week out of the noise because uh, <laughs> otherwise we'll get crazy, I think. very important it's a great message to anyone who's in the public role that that you need to like carve out some time for each other to reflect to plan to just spend that time away from everyone and everything i think that's great advice and uh you know we all we all can learn from remembering that shem is the ultimate one who pays our salaries and i love that beautiful thank you 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 come from a large family also i understand your parents are immigrants from america Where, where where did they move from my mother was born in Flatbush, and my father, I think he was raised up in Muncie, but I think he was born in, in, in New York, in, in Manhattan. In Manhattan. And, and you, but they are Chaim Berliners, if it tells you something. Chaim Berliners, Litvaks, 100%. Baruch Hashem. Although Chaim Berlin was Rav Hutner, Rav Hutner was very Hasidish. But, um, <laughs> but from, from a large family and the mother of a large family, what, what would you say to people, you know, in the world today, America especially is experiencing an enormous... Um, challenge of population growth. People are having fewer children. I think in the, in, in 90 years, we're, we're, in the last 90 years, this is the lowest rate of, of birth and population growth in America and around the world. It's a reflection of so much going on, of people being consumed with a lot of things, including themselves. They don't want to have children. And there are those who will even be critical of people with large families. Baruch Hashem Kananahar, we have seven children. Some consider that large. I was once at a, at a simcha and I was talking to a woman who's not religious, and she asked me about my family, how many children I have. I said, seven. She said, but why? You're not Chabad. That was her answer. <laughs> so, so, you know, seven sounds like a lot till you get to 12, and then you find there are people who are one of 22. So what would you say to someone who says, you know, you can't possibly love so many children the way each needs to be loved. People have a limited amount of love, and 12 children, that's not fair to them. You, you Baruch Hashem from a large family, have a large family, is love finite? Is there only a limited amount of love? Is there endless love? Is there a, can we share it equally and have countless? So first of all, people that say that. Yeah. So first of all, people that say that to me, um, how could you have so many children? And, and there's a member of Knesset here in Israel that she didn't want to have any children at all. She's a friend of mine. And she was talking to me like that. So I told her that's a shame that her mother didn't think so. And if her mother will think so, so she won't have any dilemmas because, because she won't be here. Um, but that's a good joke. Uh, and really, it's not easy. I'm not sure I gave my children all the love they needed. But I'm sure since the third one, uh, the love like became easier and um i love i love the third one so easy e- easier than the two uh, first ones i hope they they don't listen here but they, they don't understand english so it doesn't matter but uh I, i'm sure everyone each one that has more than uh, one child knows that it, it becomes easier to love and there's no limits uh to loving children you could love 12 and you could love 20 and it, it doesn't it, there's no limits uh, it's, again, sometimes I have hard days or hard weeks or hard times, and I'm not sure I gave the, my children all the love they needed, but, um, you know, I'm, uh, Hashem gave them this Nisayon. I'm their um, trail at life. That's the mother they got, and they have to deal with that. Any, any 
what are the particular beautiful things about having a large family? How would you encourage people who don't, you know, sometimes health, mental health, financially, there are legitimate reasons why people are not expanding their family. But somebody who doesn't have those concerns is just swept up in the culture today of having small families. What would you say to encourage them, particularly Jewish people? We need to grow. We need to expand. You know, when, when, when Yochavet and I were dating, at one point deep into our dating, we were talking about children. She said, how many do you want to have? I said, six million. We should have six million. We should have a child to replace one for each of the, I, I clearly didn't uh, didn't win that one. But what, what would you say to encourage people to have more children and have a larger family? What are the beauty of a large family? I think I, I have to record um, my children talking to each other when they don't see I'm listening uh, and saying one to, and, and just supporting one each other. Like once I heard them, uh, I have twins, a, a boy and a girl, and the boy was telling the girl, they're just uh, 13 years old. And he said, listen, uh, Ima, yes, me, Mama, was so angry today, and she was so um, how you say atzbanit in Hebrew? We say atzbanit, like yeah, she was sad. Not nice. no. Yeah. yeah, she was not nice today. What's going on with her? And her, his sister, his twin, uh, comforted him, and they were talking for five minutes, and then they. The two of them came back from the porch very happy. <laughs> they didn't know I was listening to them. And and, and it, it, it's really, it's it's the real thing. They could support one each other. They have one each other. I love my brothers and my sisters. That's the biggest present my mother ever gave me. And if I need something, the first ones I go to ask is my uh, brothers and my sisters. And it's such a, a, a big um, love and a, such a place to get support and, and comfort and I really believe it's it's just a good place to to live in a, a big family. I agree. Do you um, ever involve them in your job? I know that uh, you know there are definitely pros and cons of having a mother and a father who are public figures and so busy. Um, we always say that we try to find ways to reward our kids in this that they should have this opportunity, they should have that opportunity, just to make them feel better about being in a family that's that's you know has so much going on and. Do you, is there anything that you do to bring them in or to make them excited or, or they're really more like kind of just, you know, at home and you do your thing and how does did that they ever, Did they ever get to go on trips with you or meet okay. some, some famous people <laughs> or did they not care? Um, so first of all, we don't talk politics on Shabbos. And that's probably the only day that we all sit together to eat. And so we don't get to talk a lot of politics with our children. Um, and they don't like it too, so it, it, they don't look for it. But sometimes, if they have questions, so we get into a talk, and and they get all the answers um, they need. And yes, I take them with me. Um, not when I worked for the president, I I couldn't bring uh, children with me then. But today, I travel a lot too, uh, so I always take someone with me, and that's a, a big um, a big treat for me and and for the child. Like we have a few days just the two of us and we get, he gets to see me working and, and then we get to do something nice together. So um, I, I tried to do that today when I could, when I worked for the president, I couldn't bring children with me. That was so hectic. We used to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and work until midnight. And sometimes I didn't remember my name. I didn't even remember I have a name. Hmm. In America, presidents are allowed to bring their children on, on foreign trips and vice presidents, they're allowed to bring their children with them and make introductions, but that's for another time. Um, who, who would you say are your, are your biggest role models? Who inspired, who inspired you the most in the past and who inspires you the most today? Are there people that you sort of model your life or career after or just inspire you um, in, in what you do? So you asked who inspired me much, uh, most in the in the last me, me, in, uh, oh, in the, the past, past meeting, past like today. and today too. Uh, so um, when I, I still worked for the Knesset and for the president, um, who inspired me most? That's a good question. Um, maybe Putin. Maybe meeting uh, the president of Russia. I know it's not so uh, politically correct to say it today, but then he was still uh, uh, like a normal uh, <laughs> president, and he was really very impressive. Like we like we had a very impressive um, days in the Kremlin with him, 
Uh, it started with us as Israelis needing some uh, favor for him about the Syrians, and he was willing to help. And then at one point, even though we just came for a working, for a working uh, trip, it was not a, um, a state trip. He was not supposed to invite us, but he invited us for dinner. And we came to eat dinner with him. And then he told us a story about his childhood, talking about meeting a um, Jewish family at his neighborhood and staying, like, feeling uh, appreciation to the Jews and trying to treat them well. Like, it, it was very impressive. I, I remember sitting across of him so close to such a, <laughs> a, a big leader and thinking, that's crazy. Me, Rivka, like just sitting across of uh, Putin saying the bracha, uh, Baruch Shechalak. Uh, I remember that being a very impressive uh, meeting. Today, um, today, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure there's just like one uh, specific uh, person, but when I when I meet people that um, stand for their for their principles, for their values. Um, it, if they are Jews, if they are men, a woman, doesn't matter. So that makes me like to, it impresses me and it it's, it makes me to think and um, it gives open me a mind. good feeling. Open-minded to listen, to learn from them, which is really, which is really amazing. Yeah. You, you, um, you identify, that's, that's the only reason we keep bringing up, you identify as a Haredi uh, politician and administrator and executive. Um, I, it was interesting. I was in Israel over the summer and I was, I was meeting with, somebody who's, who's very Zionistic, who's a member of the Datit Zioni community, who lives in Gush Etzion, and he was saying how unfairly Haredim are treated when people try to suggest that Haredim are a drain on the economy of Israel, when he said, and he brought a whole analysis, as he shared with me, that Haredim are actually the engine driving the economy of Israel. When you have such large families, and they're consumers of products, and they're the ones in so many ways, who are driving the economy because they are the supply, they are, they are the demand that creates the, the supply. Do you think that, is there is there truth to that in, in your experience, in your analysis? Is, is the attitude towards the Haredi community unfair? Obviously, there's a piece of that, that that's about the army and the resentment of those who serve in the army for those who don't serve. But from a bigger perspective on the future of Israel, you, you referenced earlier the population, the percentage of the Haredim are, the economy, are, are people biased and unfair in how they look at and, and think about the Haredi community? Yeah, I believe it's a bias. Um, but I can't I can't tell that. The, the Ministry of, of uh, Finance, they won't hear that from me at any uh, case. But yes, I think it's a bias. First of all, women, Haredi women, work 83%. Regular worm, uh, secular women in Israel work 82%. So we are 1% more than uh, secular women at the percentage of working in the in, in Israel. So already we solved the problem of 50% of the Haredi community of the women, right? Okay. Now men work 52%. So that's, we are missing about 20%. The, the secular work about 72, 73%. So we are missing at 20%, the, uh, uh, the Haredi uh, men don't work um, as uh, the, uh, the high percentage of, of secular men. But as having uh, big families, we buy more. Uh, as being Haredi, we travel less to, to, uh, to out of Israel. We do our vacations here in Israel, so we leave our money here. Uh, most of the secular people uh, have vacations out of Israel, so they take their money out of Israel. That's the second thing. Third is uh, having here all those American yeshivas and seminaries. Just think about them. They are bringing into Israel so uh, much of, uh, of dollars and using nothing uh, of, 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 the, of the state. They, they don't get money from the state. They don't. And they just bring in a lot of money. And, and those are Haredis and those yeshivas. And so we have a lot of, of claims and we could say everything. And it's true. But the, fine, the uh, Ministry of Finance, they are not willing to hear it. Haredim are uh, not uh, <laughs> productive at their eye. And I don't know, it's, it's a real bias and I don't know how to fight it. It's interesting. I think maybe the, the politicians don't want to hear it. It would be interesting for the general community to have that 
that data and to be able to consider it. It doesn't mean that hashkafically everybody will agree or get along or will be on the same page about what's right or how, how, what, what the state of Israel should look like going forward, but at least it'd be driven by, by data and information, not just by, not just by emotion uh, alone, which I think would be, I think is important. Do you, do you have an opinion on the question? I try, do my best. I write a lot at Haaretz. That's a, a lefty um, a paper, as I said, and I write those uh, details and those um, uh, facts, and I try, but, you know, <laughs> you can't, you can't uh, talk to them with facts. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't help. What do you think about religious coercion, the kfiyah datit, and, and should the, the mix of, of religion and politics or or separation, you know, in America, what they call separation of church and state, is Israel, should it be religious in nature and imposing religious standards? Or um, is that part of the pushback, this judicial reform divide, because people are threatened that maybe that's where we're headed? How can they be less threatened so that they don't uh, go on the on the protest and attack? So that's a long uh, answer. We will need another session for that. But I could tell you in, in a few words that um, in Israel, you can't separate a religion and, and state. It's the only Jewish state in the world. We have no uh, no Jewish state in the world. And we are, we are uh, around the world, I think we are about 15 million Jews. So there's a, so, so few Jews uh, living in the Jewish, in the only Jewish state. So if we want to keep Shabbos here and we want to have our uh, hospital with no Hametz and Pesach, so why does it bother someone? Like we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, force someone to eat uh, matzah and Pesach. Just asked him to put his chametz in his in his, in his bag, not taking it out out of his bag in in, in, a, in a hospital. You know, a hospital is not a hotel. No one chooses to be in a hospital. And, he, and if he's a religious Jew and he has to be in a hospital, and and it's in Israel, the only Jewish state in Israel. So we have to have a new law, a writing that. We are able to bring in chametz into the hospital in Pesach after having 75 years of a, sta- a status quo of, of knowing that people don't bring chametz into Pesach. So we are coming and trying to, to change the law back to what was for 75 years. And that's a, a, ju- a judicial reform, you know. So that's the, the, the reason they go out and protest. So I think it's crazy. It's a Jewish state, you know. Hmm. Yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, conversation work. We'll, we'll have to have that next session because I'm curious to hear much more about what, what you think in terms of that. Um, you, um, I, I know you're pursuing a PhD. You concluded the PhD. Or you're still pursuing the PhD. Almost, now? almost done. Almost. I, it's, it, it blew my mind to think that you have uh, a BA in management computer science and two master's degrees and an MA in management information system, public administration, political science, and almost done with a PhD in public administration, political science. And, and, and do research. And I, I just don't know how you, how you get that all done. Your experience with education, does that make you want to expose your children to education to get, give them a little bit more education than they might otherwise get within their schools and their system? So that's also a tremendous debate in Israel, in the Haredi community, about academic um, education, if we should uh, send our children to universities or not. Um, so we don't have here Haredi universities yet. We have few um, colleges, but uh, not enough. So today, if you ch- if you you send your child to university, so he, he could come out of there not not religious anymore. So it's it's a big debate here. Um, I had my degrees in the open university, so I didn't have to go to university. And now having my PhD, so I travel sometimes to, ha- to Haifa. That's where I'm writing my PhD. Uh, it was not easy uh, achieving the PhD. Sometimes I think it was easier maybe to have a, another baby. <laughs> it was like more than a, uh, than a pregnancy and, uh, and and giving birth. It it was really hard. I don't know. I think in, in the states it's it's a bit easier. Here in Israel it's really so hard. Um, what motivated so, yeah, you to I'm do happy it? When what, she... what motivated what motivated you to get hmm? that PhD when you had all these other degrees and you were clearly had this job that you know you were successful? Like why? Why you just like school? You like being part of a you know a program? Like what? What motivated you? I love learning. Yeah, I love learning. I love uh, like it. It uh, it's good for my brain. Like it storms my brain. It's if I don't learn, I feel I'm <laughs> I'm falling asleep. 
It's incredible. incredible. I'm sorry, I interrupted the question. You were, you were asking about how that applies to her children's education. You know, that's okay. The debate the Haredim are having about Kona University, you were saying. You were, you were, you were, when I said, do you want to expose your children to more education? You said the Haredim have a debate about, about university. Is there anything more you wanted to add to yeah. that? No, no, I, I, it's it's a real it's a real like an, an argument here in Israel. Like people, uh, most of the of the rabbinim won't let you to send children to to the university. Yeah. Like if you if you ask a shaila, most of them will say no. It's not. It's a. It's real. A, it's really a big argument here. What, what were you, when when Joe Biden got down on the ground, and uh, was bowing down and and paying homage to you for all that you've done? What what were you thinking in that moment? I blushed. I was all red. It was really, um, uh, <laughs> I didn't believe it. It's happening. Um, afterwards, I, I remember thinking about my, my, my grandmother, my Bobby. She, she was an American and she left uh, America for after the Six Days War. Uh, she wanted her children to get a better uh, chinach. She said she thinks in Bnei Brak and in, in Jerusalem they'll get a better chinach and she left they had a big factory of coats and, and they left everything, a, a, a fairy, I don't know. They left everything and they came to Israel and the life was not so easy here, uh, you know, going back 60 years ago. But they did that with, I, I don't know, five or six children and they had two more children here. Um, and she always admired everything that had to do with the government and with, she was going around and telling everyone that her granddaughter is running the state and I was saying, Bubby, I'm just helping the president, you know, but she was like really very proud of me and she loved the the, the American presidents. She was right, reading everything about them, articles and papers and and if she would know, she, she passed away a few months before I met uh, Joe Biden, but if she would know uh, that he went down on his knees not for the reason of uh, my name is Rivka or for me being a Chief of Staff, I, I believe he's, he sees every day a few Chiefs of Staffs. Um, just for the reason that I kept um, the um, my values of having a big family and and not shaking hands with with a strange man and and those values that I got from her. She taught my mother and, and my mother taught me, and she uh, brought that from her mother and from her grandmother. I'm sure. So I believe she was. Uh, she will be very excited if she if she was if she was here to see that. That was like my thinking uh, thoughts um, when blushing uh, all red uh, across of him. What a kiddush Hashem! Amazing kiddush Hashem. That's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much for going behind the bima, okay. sharing your time on this busy era of Rosh Hashanah. One last question: What's what's next for you? Do, do will we see you be the prime minister one day, the president of Israel? Will you be a <laughs> member of Knesset? What, yes. What's next for you? I'm now getting some rest, raising my uh, youngest child. That he's only three years old, and he's very happy to have uh, his mother home. And yeah, I believe one day I will go back to politics. It's not easy to leave. It's like a, you know, it's like it's in it, it's it, if it's in your mind, you can't get it out. Um, but uh, I'll wait and I'll see what Hashem right, plans we'll, for me. We'll look forward. We'll look forward to following and to listening. Aksiva v'chasima tova, a good geben shtiar. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You know, I've read a lot of articles and I've seen interviews with her and I didn't know what to expect. Could we get into something new or different? But I was really blown away by that conversation. What what struck you, Yechavid? Well, she's so inspiring. I mean, what she packs into her day, I, I think what struck me the most was when she spoke about how she wakes up early and she does her walking. I mean, how many of us find time to exercise every day? And she davens every day early in the morning and that davening inspires her whole existence, how important that is for her. And she needs to be able to ask Hashem for what she's going to be doing that day and for her life. You know, just making sure to find that time. And even if she's waking up early, and then to and then her list, which I can relate to because I'm a massive list maker. Everything is list, list, list. You know, you make fun of me, but sometimes I'm about to go to sleep and I'm like, wait, I'm going to forget that. And I have to write it down at like 1 a.m. to put it on my list because I, you know, and the lists are great because it does keep you organized. It keeps you on track, keeps you on task. So I really relate to how you could be busy by making sure that you could still find time for the things that will 
focus your day and make you have the most energy and give you the most meaning to be able to start out your day and, and staying organized in practical ways. And I, I learned a lot from what she was saying and everything really, but that's certainly that. Yeah, that was amazing. I, I love the, um, the Rav Chaim Valajan or Einod Milvado. And I, I just thought it's something we can all employ. We're not necessarily going into a meeting with the Pope. We're not nervous about violating protocol, but we have difficult meetings, difficult conversations, negotiations, waiting for your news from something. And just to ground ourselves and center ourselves and just say, Einod Milvado, whatever's about to happen, whatever's about to be, I've got to stay true to who I am and do the best I can do in the moment. And Einod Milvado. After that, I just let go and let God because it's up to him. Einod Milvado. She was almost apologetic about a skula because she's such a litvak. Um, but, you know, Chaim Velazhner doesn't describe it as a skula. It's, it's a tefillah and it's powerful and it works. Ein od Milvada, we have that hanging on our wall, a beautiful piece of artwork that you bought, Yochavit. Thank you for that. We love that. Ein od Milvada. So I, thought, I thought that was powerful. Um, it was a great reflection of her. She's really um, remarkable in so many ways, but also something we can all take with us and that we can use in our lives in stressful situations to just, Repeat the mantra, Einod Malvado, Einod Malvado. Yep, yep. You had a whole Amuna series on that. That's why I bought you that sign because you yep. were talking about it in your class. Now, this I think what also happen. struck me about her is how she sticks to her values. And I think that's what makes her so impressive and stand out, that she could be doing this job and all of the different, uh, you know, everything that she's involved in, she stands by who she is, how she was raised. I love when she spoke about her grandmother, her mother. Like yeah. these values were clearly passed down by those women who came before her, you know, and they taught it to her and she learns how to maintain who she is as a woman, as a from, you know, as a from Jew and to keep that going and do it within the walls of politics. And right. we know it's not so easy. There's a lot in politics that could, you know, stain you, that could taint you, that could make you feel like you can't be true to yourself and you have to put on a persona or to be accepted. But I think that's why she gets so much respect and why she's moved up so much because she's strong in who she is, and, and that that's to be respected. I don't yep. blame Biden for, for bowing down to her. <laughs> she, she's the right. person that we should be bowing down to. Was be able Putin, to accomplish for that. wanting to have dinner with her. Yeah, and she obviously, that conversation, that question, she didn't mean that Putin inspires her. She meant impresses her because they're so, uh, but you know, Putin is not a personality who inspires, but she meant impresses her. And uh, Yecheved, you continue to impress me. You get it all done too. I can't wait to eat your green currant soup and your round challah. And all your delicious food is not on Rosh That's that's different behind you. That's right. So the signal, so the green current, it's not a Rosh Hashanah. What's no, the Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is more like we play with the simanim. So and it's nothing fancy. I make it all year, but I make like a squash soup, and we use carrots, and we use pomegranate. You know that that I like. I do like bringing the simanim into my meals, but I don't like doing pachkas. I really try to keep things, you know, somewhat somewhat simple and basic that it doesn't take me too long, and I could just bang it out and be ready. For davening and be ready to have beautiful yons of meals and no stress. That's my Very main. Important. Leaving some energy for actually da like the exactly. meals are lovely and nice and they're critically important. The conversations and the company and the time. Food's important too, but not to the point of exhaustion. So that an era of Rosh Hashanah, you're up till three in the morning cooking and setting that you're. I'm going to impress you right now by having chargers and plates <laughs> and chargers and mini chargers and it's lovely. It's nothing wrong with that, but not if it's going to make you late to shul, have no energy to put into your davening. It's the whole year we're talking about, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. This is the whole year. It matters. This is what counts. So we'll take this opportunity to wish all of you a good bench year. Thank you for coming on this journey. That is the greatest scholar in residence program on the planet called Behind the Bima, where you get to meet and talk to remarkable people. And uh, we heard from a lot of you who said we want Yocheved more. And so Yocheved, in the new year, will you be joining us more often? I would love to. Okay, fantastic. That is fantastic news. <laughs> So for the, the last time this year, we say to everybody, stay happy, 